you for that. Can every, everybody hear me? I'm going to be really boring and sit down because I haven't slept at all last night. I traveled all night and I've had three energy drinks, so I feel chaotic. <laughs> I have no sleep and lots of caffeine, so this is a recipe for a disaster, but I hope everything goes well. I just can't stand. It's impossible. Um, so yes, I'm going to be talking about acrasia. How many people here know what acrasia means? Two? <laughs> okay, you're going to find out. <clears throat> so the talk has to do with why people rationally know that they ought not to eat or consume other animals, but why they still continue their consumption habits. And I'm going to be looking at this dilemma or a paradox via the rationalist philosophers, particularly three. And I'm, I try, I'm going to try my best not to be tedious, and I'm going to make this as, as down to earth as possible, so it's not going to be overly theoretical. At least I hope I succeed in that. First, the meat eaters paradox. This is a paradox that has been discussed in the last few years quite a lot in sociology, psychology, and, and also philosophy. And here the problem is, why do people love animals more and more and still carry on consuming them? And lots of different psychological mechanisms have been found. For instance, cognitive dissonance, where we adhere to two completely opposing and, and contradictory beliefs at the same time. Denial, where we simply refuse to see the consequences of our actions. And references to necessity, the idea that we just have to consume other animals, even if we love them. So these are the three most prominent ways of trying to understand why we love and kill at the same time. And also the underestimation of animal cognition has been mentioned quite a few times. And it would seem to play an important role in why people still believe that even if animals are lovable, even if they have this massive love, a massive form of sen sentiment towards other animals, why do they still keep consuming them? They do not see animals as cognitively capable creatures. Um, and these issues have been discussed by Melanie Joy, who is here as well. And her concept of carnis carnism has been quite revelationary in this field. But acrasia does not mean this. Acrasia has nothing to do with love or sentiment or liking or empathy towards other animals, but rather rational decision making. And it's a really old, really old school, really uh, prominent problem in philosophy and has been for 2,000 years. And the basic problem is this. If we know rationally we ought not to do X, whatever that X is, why do we still carry on going against it? Why do we still commit the act that we know is rationally wrong? And the problem seems to be that there are lots of folks who understand the animal ethics arguments. They also understand the arguments for the environment, for global justice, world hunger, and for their own health. And they understand that suffering ought not to be caused. They all comprehend these issues rationally quite well, those who are familiar with, this, with these arguments. But they still choose to ignore them in their practical decision making. Why does this happen? So the difference to meet this paradox is the purely rational basis of, of evaluation. I'm not saying that people are rational, but the problem is even when they are, even when they think that they're making rational choices, why do they still go against them? So the dilemma for activists then is how to manage to affect a change when simply no amount of evidence or rational argumentation suffices. No matter how many arguments you give, people still won't change their habits. How to carry on? So if references to animal rights and welfare and environmental issues and health issues and global justice issues, if they all fail to convince people, how to then carry on? What to do? Should we just simply 
stop offering rational arguments and merely try and provoke empathy in others? Does rationality have anything to do with animal advocacy and animal rights and animal liberation? Is it, a, is it actually a marginal phenomenon? Now, I'm going to be arguing that it's not, and I'm going to be doing this via three rationalists, Plato and Spinoza and Descartes, who were all philosophers who were not in any way empathetic towards animals. But what they have to say about Ecclesia is quite revealing and also quite, perhaps, um, educational for advocacy. Now, to start with this philosophical paradox, we have to go back to Socrates, who actually tackled it quite extensively. Socrates is famous for arguing that immorality is always ignorance. So therefore, acrasia is impossible. If we have information, if we have a rational capacity to understand something, we will not go against it. And therefore, when people are immoral, we simply have to offer them more evidence and more rational arguments, and they will become moral. So in increasing information will, by necessity, ensure a moral change. And this has been the foundation for most, if not all, political campaigning in the past. The claim has been, or the presumption has been that as long as people are offered information, they will change. And animal advocacy has adopted this principle as well, quite extensively. Animal advocacy, advocacy seems to presume that if people are offered more and more arguments, they will stop consuming other animals. Arguments are what suffice. But the problem is that clearly, Reason does not suffice. People still go against their rationally um, formed beliefs. Reason is not enough. And this was something that Ovid quite um, capably expressed in Metamorphosis. He claimed that I see the better, yet worse pursue. We constantly know the better. We know what we ought to do, but we go against it continually. Now, the first rationalist that I'm going to be discussing is Plato, and he had a definite solution to Ecclesia. He was looking into the elements that make people go against their reason, and he was quite keen on this project. He discussed the issue in various, various dialogues. Now, he presumed that human beings are inclined to pursue the good and the truth. It's inherent to us. We want to follow reason. We want to follow the truth. And when we fail to do this, it's because of false appearances. The good is masked as evil, and the evil is masked as good. So wickedness becomes something that's actually quite a morally justifiable thing. We have false understandings, false appearances. And there's a quote here from him. The power of appearance can often make us wander all over the place in confusion, changing our minds about the same things and regretting our actions and choices. So we are wandering around in a state of confusion. On the one hand, knowing what we ought to do, and on the other hand, going against it, following false appearances. Now, Plato thought that there are two reasons for this. First, we have irrational desires. So desires make us go against what we know we ought to do. Desires are stronger than reason in many cases, and we simply follow those desires. And the other factor are emotions and wants. And these emotions and wants keep feeding the false desires, the irrational desires. So we have an emotional relation to something and a want, a need to do something. And this leads into a huge, hugely potent desire to go against reason. And it's so potent that we ultimately do not see the false or the wrong act for what it is. We start to see it as something good. So emotions and desires are to blame. And in the animal context, this is quite evident. There are lots of negative emotions that feed the need or the desire to go against reason when it comes to animal ethics. Sense of superiority, disgust, fear, 
pride and resentment are all emotions that can have a huge moral impact on our actions. And they can lead to various hierarchical moral, moral judgments. There's lots of studies in social psychology in particular, and also in philosophy, to prove that people are motivated quite strongly by emotions. In 90% of the case, people follow emotions rather than reason when they make moral decisions. Only in 10% of the time do people actually listen to their rational understanding. So they set the reason aside. And this seems to be quite evident in the context of other animals and consuming them. And these negative emotions, again, may feed irrational wants and desires. So, of course, one of the most evident desires is hedonism, culinarism. People want to eat the pork. They want to have bacon. They want to eat fish. And therefore, they follow those emotions which, which justify that desire. So they might have contempt towards, towards fish, fishes, because they want to eat them. And studies show this quite capably, quite potently. People see the least cognitive capacities and moral value in those animals that they consume the most. So Plato, already 2,000 years ago, seemed to be right. And following Plato's train of thought, animal use then becomes something that's perceived in a different light. So a person who first rationally understood the animal ethics argument starts to follow a different way of thinking. Because she's so motivated by emotions, disgust, for instance, towards pigs, and her desire to eat bacon, she, begin, she begins to perceive the consumption of pigs as something that's actually quite good. And examples of this sense of goodness when it comes to animal consumption are references, references to naturalness, pastoral images of the past and the present, where cows walk on the fields with their calves, etc. The divine order of things, humans on the top of some food chains or cosmological hierarchies. And this creates an element of beauty into the act of consuming animals. Meat-eating becomes something quite beautiful, something morally eloquent, something that we have to do. And humans are also depicted as noble caretakers, which again adds to this understanding of beauty in the context of animal consumption. Eating pigs or cows or fishes becomes a process of moral goodness, a project which shows our virtue rather than vice. So, what we first understood rationally becomes turned on, his, on its head, and this is the state of Ecclesia. Plato's solution to this state was cultivation. It's not, it's, it's, it's not only important to understand why Ecclesia happens, but it's perhaps more significant to understand how to avoid it. And Plato argued that cultivation is hugely important, really paramount. paramount. And here, self-control takes the primary role. We ought to practice self-control, fight those emotions and desires that make us wander all around the place in a state of confusion, as Plato suggested. And here, Plato made his quite radical remark, which is often take, taken out of context. Plato argued that emotion should be the slave of reason. And he didn't do that because he undermined the role of emotions. Rather, he did it because he understood that emotions can lead to a state of ecclesia, where we do completely immoral and irrational acts. So we ought to constantly control emotions. This may sound harsh, but for Plato, it was the only road towards moral goodness. And here's another quote. A person who wants to be happy must evidently pursue and practice self-control. Each of us must flee from lack of discipline as quickly as his feet will carry him. Now, self-control is a very alien concept to modern culture and contemporary thought. As the philosopher called Alistair McIntyre has argued, cultivation of the human 
potential to be virtuous, to be good, has been left out from modern philosophy and modern culture in general. It's been completely forsaken. And instead, I would argue that the contemporary culture is filled with this idea that we must be accepted as we are. Cultivation is, seemed, is seen as something overly harsh. We should not control ourselves. We ought to just let ourselves flow freely, do what we want, and demand to be accepted as exactly the type of beings that we happen to be. And there's an egocentric demand for this acceptance, and it really is an egocentric demand. I stopped going to yoga because the yoga classes were filled with, with this mantra of love yourself as you are and demand that your environment loves you as you are. I see that as nonsense. We ought to constantly try to be better. We shouldn't just egocentrically, selfishly assume that we are good as we are. Life is a constant moral process of trying to become more virtuous. So in the contemporary culture, there's a significant loss of the will towards cultivation. It's seen in a really negative light. And this would seem to be an important factor behind omniverse, uh, omnivore's ecclesia. Meat eaters see it as something highly negative when they are told that they ought to change their ways. They see it as preaching. They see it as something which criticizes them. They see it as moralizing. And these terms are quite revealing. They suggest that the meat eater feels bad in herself and views this feeling as something inherently negative, something that ought never to happen. But for Plato, we all should feel bad about things. We all should constantly try and cultivate ourselves. We should accept not ourselves as we are, but the fact that we must change. And simultaneously, consumerism, which feeds this idea of accepting yourself as you are, is based on feeding us emotions and wants, which lead into these false desires, which Plato mentioned. So there's a really odd and twisted combination between emotions and wants, which the consumeristic society pushes onto us, and the want to be accepted in those emotions and wants, without ever cultivating oneself or viewing oneself in any critical light. So perhaps many meat eaters or milk drinkers simply demand to be accepted in their consumer choices. They want to be accepted as omnivores. And this is again really evident in many of the arguments that they offer. They say, who are you to come and tell me what, what I ought to do? How dare you criticize my actions? And this reveals something, a certain psychological mechanism that I argue isn't only, I mean, we can't fight it only on the basis of adding more empathy into the mixture. We also have to add this sense of cultivation into it. The notion that people have to change. We all have to change all the time. So, as I mentioned, vegan advocacy is often viewed as preachy, as a violation of one's autonomy, as a violation of one's value, or as something utterly boring or tedious. And vegans are viewed as people who have a sense of self-superiority. And this notion again reveals something in the person who says that statement. They are angry that their e egoistical will to be accepted exactly in their in the wants and desires is violated. So there's lots of anger at the thought of moral cultivation. Now how to get into the root of this lack of the will to cultivate? This would seem to demand a so social change, a societal change. Empathy is not enough. We have to also, also take into account our sense of identity, how people view themselves and view morality, whether they see any need for cultivation, 
and why they fail to see any need for cultivation. Now, this is a topic discussed by um, Amelie Rorty, quite a famous philosopher, contemporary philosopher. And she has an <coughs> Aristotelian take on both the creation and the society. She argues that social institutions should constantly support moral cultivation. They should be telling us not to accept ourselves as we are, but to constantly pay attention to our moral choices and our moral identity, our identity as moral agents. And therefore, social institutions should support the decreasement of ecrasia. They should make us into beings who wish not to be acratic. And she argues that the problem with the contemporary moral theory is internal, internalism. And this means that moral choices are made into something which exists in the heads or the minds of individual beings. They are not viewed as something which are socially created or constructed. And we fail to notice that the society ought to really support cultivation, constant cultivation. And in fact, the creation, according to her, is produced by various contradictions and conflicts in the values that we are offered. We are told to respect animal welfare at, at, the, at the one hand, and on the other hand, we are told that we ought to eat those very same animals. And for her, so, social change, which would decrease ecrasia, requires that these contradictions are brought forward and that those institutions are changed and altered in a very radical and fundamental way. So we ought to make education and economy and even health um, into institutions which constantly tell us to pay attention to why we value the way that we do and whether we could add some cultivation into the mixture. Now, in the animal context, this is quite evident, this societal impact. The social institutions constantly invite ecratic emotions and wants and desires in people. The anthropocentric society is filled with huge contradictions, which is clear, in our ways of evaluating and valuing other animals. We are told, as I said, to pay attention to welfare, to say that animal suffering is a moral evil that we ought to avoid. But at the same time, we are told that we ought to consume animals in ways that by necessity cause infringements on welfare and suffering. So in order to effect a change here, in order to make acrasia less prominent, we should reconfigure education, law, market relations, and other societal institutions so that they would support moral cultivation constantly, not only in relation to other human beings, but also in relation to other animals. And this would require really radical fundamental changes into social institutions. And one of the questions is, can a consumeristic society ever support such a change? Is consumerism something that we ought to eradicate? And I would suggest that as long as the institutions keep feeding ecrasia, a lack of self-cultivation, no amount of empathy, no amount of adding more emotion into the picture will suffice. Animal advocacy should pay much more emphasis on altering and criticizing and revealing and exploring the way that societal institutions constantly um, enhance anthropocentrism. The role of these institutions is rarely noted, at least in practical activism. So that was Plato. And the next philosopher that I will be discussing is Baruch Spinoza, who was another rationalist. How many of you have heard of Spinoza? Thank you. It's good to know that at least half of you have heard of him. So I won't have to go, to, go into great detail in, in explaining his background. He was a rationalist and, and very keen on advocating the role of reason 
and a very prominent philosopher in his own time. And he has had a massive impact on contemporary thought, even though his name is often forgotten. Now, he also discussed Ecclesia quite extensively. He argued that lack of self-control is a form of bondage. So he started with this Plato's notion that we should cultivate ourselves. And he asked, why do we not do that? Why do we fail to pay attention to self-control? And he suggested <clears throat> that we live in a state of bondage. It's as if our hands and feet are tied together so that we cannot move in the moral zone. We fail to be, be moral creatures because we are stuck in a kind of a claustrophobic prison of our minds. And again, like Plato, he blamed emotions for this. He argued that we constantly fall onto the mercy of emotions, which then leads into a crazia. And we fall onto the mercy of fortune, of mere luck. We simply stop thinking and just go with the flow. Whatever emotions we happen to have, whatever desires we happen to have, we follow them. And we fail to pay attention to reason, even if on the background we know what is rational. So you might notice that emotions are here criticized all the time, which I think is a good thing because even though it's very valuable to notice the positive role of many emotions like empathy, they can be too, I mean, the image can be too idyllic. The negative emotions which impact perhaps much more significantly our relations to other animals are not noted. Emotions should not just be celebrated, they ought to also be viewed critically. Now, Spinoza argued that ecclesia consists of this bondage. We do evil even when we know the good. And there's a quote here. Man's lack of power to moderate and restrain the effects I call bondage. For the man who is subject to effects is under the control, not of himself, but of fortune, in whose power he so greatly is that often... Though he sees the better for himself, he is still forced to follow the worse. So there's a reference here to Ovid's quote, which I mentioned in the beginning of the talk. We follow emotions, and emotions form the bondage, which restricts our moral capacity. He went so far that he argued that emotions are a form of insanity or madness. So again, like Plato, he was quite critical of emotions. There's another quote here. Greed, ambition, and lust really are a species of madness, even though they are not numbered among the diseases. So loads of various emotions for him were a form of mental illness a kind of letting go of reason and identity at the same time, falling onto the mercy of fortune and simply following whatever inclinations one happens to have. One's capacity to be a moral creature is at the same time lost. Now, next to vilifying emotions, Spinoza also referred to public op opinion or doxa, as another source of ecclesia. He argued that ecratic individuals are indeed made insane by emotions, but at the same time they follow public opinion or cultural habit, which feed those emotions. And this leads into a complete eradication of reason. One no longer knows what's rational at all. So we have these insane emotions and public opinions which enforce the legitimacy of those emotions all the time. There's a vicious circle between public opinion and emotions. And we do not step back and reflect in the end in the slightest. We simply accept public opinions and emotions as they are. And this is the state of bondage. Humans lose their minds, according to Spinoza. This is what madness to him meant. We no longer think. We become like puppets of various inclinations. 
Now again, in the non-human context, this seems to be quite, quite evident. Various emotions can act as a form of bondage. The emotions that I mentioned before, like a sense of superiority or greed or disgust or hedonism, all feed the desire to keep on consuming other animals. And if we really follow Spinoza, they can lead into a state where people are incapable of making rational choices. No amount of rational arguments will suffice. No amount of advocacy, um, advocates telling meat eaters how they are failing in moral reason is adequate. No amount of animal ethics arguments can persuade a meat eater or a milk drinker who is in a state of bondage. These emotions constantly feed into anthropocentrism. And at the same time, various forms of public opinion emphasize those emotions. So various stereotypical cultural takes or understandings of other animals feed into disgust, for instance. So if pigs are viewed cognitively incapable, humans tend to have contempt or even disgust or even hatred towards them. So there's a vicious cycle, vicious, vicious circle between emotions and public opinions. And this leads into accepting cultural norms as self-evidently true, regardless of how much reasons there are to question them. And this is something that Spinoza also underlined. Even when people understand that various cultural opinions are ridiculous, absurd, even when they know that the stereotypical understanding of pigs as cognitively incapable is false. The emotions that they have make them follow those understandings. So even if a person is offered lots of cognitive ethology, lots of studies on the mental capacities of pigs, if she has the emotions of disgust or contempt on the background, she will not change her habits. She will keep on consuming those animals. And vice versa, no matter how much she is told not to feel contempt or disgust towards animals, if she has the cultural stereotypes or the public opinions which enforce the idea that pigs are cognitively incapable, she will not change. And therefore, self-cultivation becomes impossible. And emotions and public opinions indeed support each other. The anthropocentric culture feeds contempt and disgust and various other Emotions, hedonism, greed, economic greed or culinary greed in relation to other animals. And again, these emotions support those public opinions. And this in the Spinoza's viewpoint, in Spinoza's viewpoint, leads into acrasia. This is why people will not be persuaded by animal ethics arguments, nor by arguments that show how concern for the environment or global justice ought to make people vegan. Nothing suffices. It's a state of bondage. Now, after all this talk of emotions as something quite negative, it has to be noted that Spinoza also saw them as something quite positive. And this is his solution to Ecclesia. So again, like Plato, he doesn't only mention or discuss why a creature takes place, but he also wants to offer solutions, how to escape it. And he argued that there are loads of emotions that have hugely positive potential in morality. Indeed, emotions for Spinoza were the basis of much of our moral capacity. Next to reason, he did note the relevance of emotions in a positive light. For Spinoza, emotions are a form of effect which moves the mind and moves the body. They are the source of what he called conatus, which means a sense of vitality or energy. And this is a concept that has been forsaken for modern philosophy and modern culture, but it used to be quite popular amongst philosophers for nearly 1,500 years. This sense of vitality or fire energy was viewed to be something that's at the root of moral behavior. So next to reason, 
we also have to have the motivation to follow that reason, and that comes from Conatus, the vitality. And emotions can support that vitality, the fire to do what's right. Now, how to differentiate between those emotions which lead into a crazy and those emotions which lead into morally sound beliefs and actions? Spinoza argued that the fruitful emotions are internal. They stem from within. And how to differentiate between external and internal emotions, again, was a matter of whether those emotions follow internal reflection or reason. So basically this means that if we have emotions which flow or entwine with rational thought processes, they are internal emotions. They come from ourselves. We know the, their validity. They do not just stem from the consumeristic society, for instance. We ourselves have evaluated those emotions and we decide to go with them. And when we decide to go with these morally reflected, rationally reflected emotions, vitality and energy start to take place. And therefore, these sorts of rational emotions are indeed a source of motivation. In the end, they are the source of the life force which is in us. We become filled with the fire to do what's right. And actually, we only have our will to stay alive if we have these emotions. Those individuals who do not have these emotions will quite soon become depressed, anxious. They lose hope. Only rationally reflected emotions for Spinoza were a way towards vitality and energy and also moral goodness. Now, it's the external emotions which are the threat. These are the ones that Spinoza thought that we ought to cultivate away. We ought to control them. Not the internal emotions, but the external emotions. And the external emotions originate completely from the external world. We do not reflect on them. They have never gone through our internal thought processes. Rather, we simply accept them often unconsciously, often unintentionally, without ever reflecting on them. We absorb from the surrounding culture various emotions and just follow them. And these to him were the biggest threat. These to him were the source of bondage, which we ought to constantly resist and cultivate away. They are non-reflected emotions. And he was quite radical in the way that he depicted the consequence of following these emotions. He argued that we become broken beings if we follow them. We become absolutely confused, contradictory in our actions and in our emotions. We become emotionally volatile. We jump from one emotion to the other without being balanced as moral agents. And ultimately, we become utterly anxious and depressed. We lose the will to live, according to Spinoza. We become barren emotionally. These external emotions constantly just take a hold of us and twist us from one side to the other, and we become as if robotic. And when we, when we become robotic, we lose vitality. We lose our sense of purpose and meaning and the inner energy to stay alive. Spinoza suggested that these external emotions are based on doxa, the public opinion which so much affects us. We accept the ambivalent authority of cultural beliefs rather than reflect on their validity. We stop using our rational capacities. And this is when we start to argue that we, are, we must be accepted as we are. And this is when people go to I have nothing against yoga, don't get me wrong, but this is when people, when they are anxious, go to yoga centers where they are told to love themselves as they are. They are made confused and anxious and depressed by the cult constant cultural pressure of the societally produced emotions. We lose konatus, the energy of life. 
And it's here where the sources of bondage can be found, external emotions. We become passive recipients of externally produced emotions and public opinions. So when Spinoza suggests that we ought to control emotions, he is talking of these external emotions. We constantly should pay attention to why we feel what we feel and reflect on those emotions, where they stem from, what's their source, and whether they <coughs> flow with our rational ability, our reflection. Emotions ought to be reflected constantly. And this is self-cultivation. Now, this is where we get to the most beautiful bit of Spinoza's philosophy in general, but also his solution to Ecclesia. He argued that inter internal emotions are a source of joy. Joy was a central concept to his philosophy. He's often mentioned as the philosopher of joy. And joy is linked to this conatus, this vitality, the energy of life, the fire of being. And it's the... It's the most excellent of moral, moral emotions that we have. It reveals goodness to us. So when we feel joy, when we feel elevated, this to him was a sign of witnessing goodness. In a moment of elevation, we have grasped something about morality. We have perceived morality, goodness. And melancholy or depression, again, was a sign of witnessing evil. We see something contradictory, barren, and ultimately morally crooked when we feel depression. So he suggested that we ought to pay attention to when we feel joy. And he also argued that joy had been completely forgotten by his contemporary era. And I would argue that it's still completely forgotten. We do not talk of joy enough. Now, Spinoza went so far as to argue that joy is goodness. Here's a quote from him. By good here I understand every kind of joy and whatever leads to it. So joy is the ultimate goodness, the ultimate moral definer of our existence. It is morality. This is where our moral agency stems from, feelings of joy. It makes us capable of seeing goodness, but also it produces that goodness into the world. So when Spinoza argued or claimed <clears throat> that joy is goodness, what he meant was that when we feel joy, we become good. We start to make good things happen. And this again increases our vitality, the fire of life. And therefore, joy is intrinsically motivating. We want to do what is right. We want to do what is good because we feel joy. This is where goodness stems from. This is where it originates from. Joy is goodness. I'll soon get to the animal bit. <clears throat> Here's a short introduction to Spinoza's philosophy. External emotions, however, as Spinoza noted, are often stronger. No matter how much joy we want to feel, how, no matter how we want to follow internal emotions, the external is stronger. And this is because their sources are endless and there's only one of us. So one individual with her capacity for reflection and therefore towards internal emotions and joy cannot fight the constant bombardment of public opinion and publicly produced emotions. And this is where we become slaves of external emotions. We become uncertain and confused and anxious. And we also become immoral. We become ecratic. Ecrasia originates here. So, in order to have self-cultivation, in order to control ourselves, we need to constantly cultivate external emotions. We have to pay attention to where our emotions stem from, and we need to reflect on them rationally. And when we do, we might suddenly feel immense joy, and this joy again pushes us towards moral goodness, morally sound actions. So... Even though empathy, for instance, is a very valuable emotion, perhaps other positive emotions should be discussed also in animal advocacy. And one of them is joy. <clears throat>
Now, in the animal context, it would be, therefore, really significant to pay attention to internal reflected emotions because they motivate, if we follow Spinoza's train of thought, motivate concern towards the world. They make us into moral beings. So advocacy should pay attention to how they try and persuade <clears throat> the meat-eating and the egg-eating and the milk-drinking and the leather-using society to become internally reflective. Now, the way to do this is to pay attention to joy. Joy adds to the vitality of human beings. And this might be a way of persuasion which is based on egoism, but if you point out towards people that their own lives would become far richer if they <clears throat> take internal emotions into account, that their lives will be filled with vitality and joy, they might be far more persuaded to follow reason and follow animal ethics. And I would argue that currently animal ethics and animal advocacy is viewed and perceived as highly negative, a great demand or a sacrifice. People are told to give up things. Their lives will therefore become deprived somehow. It's a demand or a sacrifice that they are asked to make. They will become impoverished by becoming vegan. This is how most people, I would argue, view vegan advocacy as a form of sacrifice, as something negative, away from their own life experiences. And therefore, it would be something that decreases their vitality. It doesn't add to it. It makes them more miserable. So therefore, perhaps a new notion should be added to animal ethics and animal advocacy. This, source of, this form of philosophy of joy, which would be potency adding to human beings as well. So emphasis would be on how much enrichment to, hu to human lives veganism brings. It's not a sacrifice, a sacrifice, it's not a demand, it's not something that impoverishes us, but rather it's something that enables, enriches and cultivates human lives. It adds joy. And it would be quite important, if we follow Spinoza, to bring this notion of joy into advocacy. A creature would be perhaps significantly diminished. People would be more willing to follow reason if they understood that it benefits them too and increases vitality all around. But there is the challenge of the external, because marketing and cultural institutions and discourses and the media constantly push various external emotions onto us. As Spinoza argued, these external emotions are stronger than one individual and how her will to be joyful or rational. And in practice, this would mean that there's a constant need for self-cultivation. This brings us again back to Plato. We have to constantly make um, decisions which imply self-control and cultivation. And as I mentioned in, in relation to Plato, the modern contemporary culture is not willing to do this. And therefore, we should perhaps try and change human identity into something that's more willing to accept control as something inherently positive rather than demanding or harsh or hollow, or hollow somehow. <clears throat> so human identity ought to be changed towards a direction that includes the notion of control, self-cultivation, rather than constant passive hedonism. And in order to make this happen, we have to go back again to the wider societal changes. Social institutions, particularly education, should be altered so that already children are taught it's good to cultivate, it's good to control one's emotions, not just demand acceptance for whatever one happens to be. Human identity ought to be centralized. 
And this is a massive undertaking and, undertaking and something that would perhaps increase the potentials of vegan advocacy enormously. Cultivation is needed in order for joy to become um, possible. Now, so there were the two first rationalist philosophers, Plato and Spinoza, and their way of understanding Acrasia. Both of them talk of the negative role of emotions, but the latter also of the importance of positive emotions. And both of them emphasize self-cultivation, and the implication is that societal change is needed. Human identity needs to be altered in order for us to want to become morally joyful beings. And in animal advocacy, this would mean that self-cultivation and joy should be brought forward, not just empathy and not just rational arguments. And the third philosophy is Descartes, who is usually mentioned in the most negative light in animal philosophy, and for very good reasons. But he wasn't the sinister, horrible philosopher as he is often depicted in, in animal philosophy. He was also quite a profound moral thinker, regardless of what he thought of other animals. He is the most famous villain when it comes to mechanomorphia, or understanding other animals as pure, purely mechanical beings. But setting this aside, he had a very beautiful moral philosophy. And this stems from his understanding of Ecrasia. He also tackled Ecrasia quite extensively. Now, like Plato, Descartes argued that emotions spark various false or irrational desires, and these leads into false appearances. So we have desires and emotions which make us think that the evil is actually goodness, and thereby we become ecratic. We start to go against reason. But he specified three different ways in which this happened, happens. And he talked of a cratic, an acratic break, which is the source of acrasia. So this acratic break means that something happens in the rational thought processes of, of humans. Suddenly something twists, something breaks. We become fractured as moral agents. Acrasia originates here but the three factors that lead to such breaks were significant to him, and he discussed them in great length. First of all, he thought that cognitive defects lead into these breaks. We simply have various defects in our understanding of things. There's something wrong with us psychologically. Secondly, he spoke of societal attitudes, again, public opinion, various customs, as sources of these breaks. And third, he spoke of redirection of attention. And redirection of attention here means that we go with the rational thinking, but suddenly something makes us shift our attention away from it into something else. We become defocused. We become disorientated. We start to pay attention to the insignificant aspects of the choices that we are making. Now, I won't talk of this redirection of attention in, in any greater length, because it comes close to cognitive dissonance and denial and the other features which, are, which have been discussed when it comes to meat-eaters' paradoxes. There's lots of literature on this, and I do not need to go into it now. But it's interesting that Descartes already saw this. Nearly 500 years ago, he was talking of the same thing, that contemporary <coughs> theorists in the, in the fields of animal ethics are discussing. Redirection of attention seems to be the source of moral wickedness in many cases. But what's interesting here, <coughs> and novel here is the combination of cognitive defects and societal attitudes. And I would argue that the two often combine in the context of other animals. So 
the anthropocentric and consumeristic attitudes are sources for cognition alteration. We become different as beings. We become more hedonistic, more competition oriented more prone towards emphasizing instrumentalization of others, more prone towards emphasizing aggression and domination. Because of the society and its way of, of um, constantly bombarding us with various public opinions and attitudes. And this might mean that we are becoming more prone towards aggression. Now, interestingly, in psychiatry, aggression has been talked of, not in any great length, quite marginally, but when it has been talked of, they talk of these cognitive defects as sources of it. Narcissism, impulsivity, apathy, and, and ambivalence have been mentioned quite a few times. A creature could stem from narcissism where the person who is completely rational cannot fail to follow her own ego. So she will always emphasize her own culinary desires, for instance, her hedonistic inclinations. Impulsivity, again, refers to the incapacity to concentrate and remain stable. We jump from one emotion to another, one thought to another, and become utterly impulsive and even chaotic in our choices. Apathy refers to a state where we simply do not care. We cease caring about moral issues. And ambivalence means a state where we cannot make a decision. We are under the influence of so many different opinions that we do not know which of them is the right one. Our rational capacity might see all of them as correct, and we do not know what to do. Now, if in psychiatry these tendencies have been related and linked to acrasia, it would seem that they um, stem from societal attitudes. So these cognitive defects, originate from societal attitudes, which again would mean that the consumeristic society, the anthropocentric society, is making us more narcissistic and impulsive and apathetic and ambivalent. We become more egocentric, less capable of remaining stable in our choices. We become far more apathetic. We cease caring. We say, I do not give up when it comes to morality. And we become ambivalent because the consumeristic society is highly ambivalent. It tells us, that, tells us that there are no right choices. Whatever we want to do is okay, as long as we purchase things. Morality becomes a matter of relativity, a, a subjective choice. And next to the consumeristic society, anthropocentrism seems to be making these characteristics or cognitive defects much more prominent. Oh, this is my hypothesis. So the question then is, are we becoming more impulsive and apathetic and ambivalent in relation to other animals, more narcissistic in relation to them? If a gracious stems from cognitive defects and societal attitudes, do these two combine and do the societal attitudes make the cognitive defects much more prominent? much more influential and much more restrictive. And if so, again, societal change would be the key. Not just personal, rational decision-making, but societal change, which would then enable people to become less inclined, less cognitively defective, less prone towards aggression. Now, again, just like Plato and Spinoza, Descartes also offered a solution to Ecclesia. And his solution was generosity. And I think this is, if Spinoza's understanding of joy as a solution is quite beautiful, so is generosity. This is where Descartes gets really uh, eloquent in his moral philosophy. For him, generosity was the most fundamental of all virtues. It's the basis, the grounds of moral agency. We must be generous towards others if we want to be good. 
And generosity, like joy, has been forgotten from contemporary thought. It's hardly ever mentioned. And perhaps it would be good to bring it back to also animal advocacy, not just animal philosophy, or philosophy in general. Now, generosity consists of rational autonomy, the capacity to think for oneself, at least partially. The capacity to reflect on things. Secondly, it consists of responsibility, a sense of carrying responsibility towards others, a sense of knowing that our actions have an impact on others. And thirdly, generosity requires goodwill, the will to take others into account, even when this requires self-sacrifice. And ultimately, generosity requires a pause, a radical stepping back away from one's constantly egoistic, often very hedonistic lifestyle, and of reflecting on the emotions and the cognitive defects and the societal attitudes that ceaselessly impact us. It requires a pause, which is followed by a refocus on things. So in practical terms, when we are making decisions and when we are acting in relation to others, we should, according to, according to Descartes, constantly take these moments of a pause and reflect on whether we are being rational, whether we are being autonomous in our reason, whether we are being responsible and whether we have goodwill towards others. And only by following these traits can we resist egoism or narcissism or hedonism or impulsivity, apathy and ambivalence. Only if we are told to take these pauses, take these moments of stepping back, can we re regain our sense of generosity and can we fight a creature. And this directs us towards cultivation again, back towards cultivation. Generosity is a form of cultivation, form of self-control. And here's quite a beautiful remark from Descartes, which shows or manifests how he was a good guy, regardless of his understandings of other animals. He wanted us to be completely altruistic towards other human beings, to make complete radical self-sacrifices in order to serve others. So he says, true generosity, which makes a man esteem himself as highly as he can legitimately esteem himself, consists only, on, only in this, partly in his understanding that, understanding that there is nothing which truly belongs to him, but his free control of his volitions, and no reason why he ought to be praised or blamed except that he uses it well or badly, and partly in his feeling with, within himself a firm and constant res resolution to use it well, that is, never to lack the volition to undertake and execute all the things he judge, judges to be best, which is to follow virtue perfectly. So we ought to reflect again, cultivate ourselves, think whether our choices are, are our own or whether they are societally produced, and take pride in ourselves only when we do this. View ourselves positively only when we are generous towards others. We should constantly judge for ourselves, and only this makes us virtuous. Now, what does generosity in the non-human context mean? First, if we follow Descartes, it would mean willingness to reflect on animal ethics, at least relatively free from cultural pressure. It would demand that people are not simply told what the arguments are, but rather that they are invited to think about them, that they are invited to come to the conclusions themselves. It's, it's so much more effective for a person to come to the conclusion herself than it is for somebody to tell her what the argument is. Only this can lead into generosity. So perhaps advocates should not be preaching. They should not give ready-made answers, but they ought to evoke moral reflection in others, in those meat-eaters and milk drinkers. This is what 
autonomous reflection means. Secondly, there should be willingness to take responsibility. And again, the advocates or the animal ethicists role is to evoke this willingness in others. The notion of responsibility. So instead of simply offering arguments, a sense of responsibility ought to be stirred. The feeling that we owe it to others to take them into account. And thirdly, goodwill in relation to animals should be invited. This goodwill perhaps comes close to empathy. So perhaps we could combine empathy under its broad spectrum. But it means also something more, not just resonation with the mental states or experiences of others, but the intention to do good towards those others. And if Spinoza's joy has been missing from animal advocacy, so perhaps is this goodwill, this generosity. And to summarize, Plato blamed emotions and wants and false, de false desires for Eucrasia and argued that we should cultivate ourselves. And for this to happen, societal change is needed. Advocacy and animal ethics should pay attention to the ways in which edu education or the financial system or economy, even health, even social work, whatever societal institutions that you can name, how they impact our understanding of morality and other animals. Whether they make us into self-cultivating creatures or whether they just make us into those egoistical beings who demand acceptance no matter what. Then second, there is Spinoza and his claim that bondage leads to a creature. Bondage under external emotions and public opinion. And in order to get away from this, we should cultivate internal emotions and joy. And joy would make people, by necessity, according to him, act morally, be responsible, well-meaning individuals, filled with the vibrance and vitality of goodness. And thirdly, Descartes blamed mental defects and social customs in particular for Ecclesia and suggested that generosity is a way, is a way away from them. We ought to have goodwill, sense of responsibility, and the willingness to reflect for ourselves if we want to avoid Ecclesia. And to summarize, this is the last slide. In order to combat aggression or eradicate it altogether in the context of non-human animals or moral understandings of those animals, these rationalist classics would suggest that advocacy and animal ethics should pay more attention to self-cultivation, the societal level, the level of social institutions, joy and generosity. So instead of simply offering arguments and telling others what they ought to do, our notion of what it is to be a moral being should be impacted. Meat eaters and milk drinkers should be pushed towards the willingness to cultivate themselves. And this only happens via societal change, a change in the social institutions. And Animal advocacy or veganism should be made into something which is joyful, enriching, adds to the vitality of human life, not something which is away from it. Joy should be added into the mixture, mixture too. It's a good thing I'm nearly finished because I can't speak anymore. And fourthly, generosity, the willingness to reflect, should be uh, stirred in others. Milk drinkers and egg eaters and leather users and hunters should be pushed towards coming to the conclusions themselves. Ready-made arguments are not, perhaps, always the best way forward. There should be internal reflection and also a notion of responsibility and goodwill towards other animals. So, these are some solutions to the activists frustration and dilemma when it comes to the fact that rational arguments do not suffice. Thank you.